Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Maximizing Value of Real-Time Data in the Azure SQL Data Warehouse. I'm Carol and I'll be your moderator today. This webinar is being recorded and all attendees will be sent a link to the recording after the webinar is over. Um, we'll also be doing question and answer at the end of this webinar. And uh, so if you have any questions throughout the uh, webinar today, please type them into the question uh, section of the control panel. Okay, and now if you can go to the next slide, I'll introduce our speakers. Today's speakers are gonna be Joel Dodd, the analytics data architect from Attunity, and Rajiv Jain, uh, Azure product marketing lead at Microsoft. Joel, over to you. All right, thank you, Carol. So what I wanna talk about here first is around really that maximizing value of real-time data in the Azure SQL Data Warehouse. And the first thing I wanted to really kind of introduce is really my role in uh, Attunity as a data analytics data architect. And what I do is I work with a lot of customers like you on a daily basis, kind of understanding uh, really around the challenges with the existing warehouses and then really where the analytics is trying to go to maximize the value of the business in terms of strategic initiatives. And one of the things that we continually hear is repeated themes about challenges with the existing analytics repository. And the first ones, it's really around a two-pronged problem. Uh, it's around data processing and how that data gets into it, really back to that first point about real-time data needs not really being met. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in the, the next slide. But the other prong of the problem is really around the infrastructure, uh, both the SQL engines and the server resources uh, become inflexible and not able to support the analytics workloads. And there's a couple reasons for that is that a lot of these uh, existing analytics repositories have been built for years and continue to con grow as the individual's data requirements continue to migrate along the journey. So as more and more analytics problem sets get added into these repositories, uh, it starts to actually put a strain on what each of these analytic repositories can provide. Uh, because when you really are looking at the fixed infrastructure of multiple servers, as well as those SQL engines, as the increased data requirements grow, the infrastructure is inflexible to support those growing analytic needs. So that you run into the problem of either having to continually scale out your servers or to prioritize or constrain the expanding analytic workloads. So you start running into issues with the analytics teams and the line of business trying to continue to add more and more capabilities that will drive the business to their initiatives. And the, the bottom line is, it's not an agile, enough, an agile enough solution that can support the pace of new business, strategic business initiatives. But I mentioned two-prong approach, the one or two-prong problem. The second prong of the problem is really around how that data gets into these data warehouses. And most of these have been grown over the years using a very manual-based approach where, you know, the, those numerous different sources of that rich data could be across CRM, ERP, maybe it's a, an SAP system or even legacy mainframe systems like DB2 or vSAM. But the, the process of getting that data into these various areas within the, the analytics repositories is really a manual-based process. And it's actually a series of different manual ETL coding or tooling that's pulling that data into more of a, like an ingestion zone, zone, excuse me, and then into the structuring of that data where it's working on trying to build that data into analytical ready data. So there's ETL processes that are involved in each step of these way that are used to structure that data for each of the different constituents needing those data in, in, all the way down to a data mark. But because of these data process become very manual, it's also a very long 
process to get that data out of these systems and through these structures and into those data marts. And by the time it gets down to your analytics teams, they start looking at the issues that they're seeing with the data. It uh, may be that the, the data is no longer what they need anymore. So a lot of these data analytics teams are very resourceful and given the constraints that the business provides them, have to go out and go search that data out on their own. So the time that the data finally gets to them, they've already figured out a way to get it and maybe even have better data than what's in the data mart. They also start to see that how old the data is because of the lengthy time to get the data from the source systems into the data marts. They really don't find the usefulness of the data when it's, you know, could be anywhere from a few months to upwards of six months old because these processes really work on getting all that data out of those source systems but don't really keep that up to date in real time which is one of those challenges that we mentioned on the prior slide and then the final thing they start to see is that the data is not exactly what they wanted the analytics process is very dynamic and changing and as they start to look at the insights that they derive they start realizing there's additional data elements and also new source data that comes available. And then as that data comes available, they need to actually add that data back into the data mart. And what this does is provides impacts on every stage of this cycle. So it goes all the way back to the source systems that may need new data elements to be propagated through this structure, as well as changes across uh, each stage of the zone where you want to structure the data, blend that data, as well as getting it into that down, downline data streams. And this becomes a real challenge. And over time, what the data warehouse team ends up doing is shortchanging that process and taking shortcuts that make this even more complex of a solution. So when you start looking at you know, what the solution to this is, it's really also a two-prong approach to the solution. And the first one is really looking at these modern cloud analytics repositories. And what these provide is really an answer to all those challenges that we saw on that first challenge slide. And it's really about taking advantage of the really nature of the elastic scalability of those cloud platforms. So these cloud analytics repositories like HD Insight or the data lake storage really provide that elastic scalability as well as what we'll talk about primarily today is the SQL data warehouse and providing that better model for elastic scalability as well as better cost models to pay for what you're actually using as opposed to those older models where you really have to pay for the infrastructure, continuing to build more and more infrastructure in order to provide the largest query that your uh, analytics team needs to, or even those peak demand. So the cloud analytics platforms provide that that those capabilities. And Rajiv will talk a little later about more details about SQL Data Warehouse and really how it specifically helps to answer these, these needs. But the final part of this process is really the key to success is really the combined strategy that we're gonna talk about today. And that's how Attunity and Microsoft together can provide a comprehensive data pipeline to a best of class cloud analytics repository. And this is really uh, kind of a conglomerate of the architecture that we end up seeing a lot of times from various different customers like yourselves that are looking at how do they build out these streaming pipelines into those analytic repositories. And it's really around a multi-zone approach of automating that data from out of these various different source systems, landing that data, moving it into those data lakes, preparing the data, and delivering it into where the consumers will then pick that up and add value to that. And that's really where both the Attunity platform and Microsoft play together. And specifically today, we'll talk about Azure SQL Data Warehouse. The first phase is really where the Attunity platform picks up and really handling the data pipeline around this. And it really is a multi-zone approach where in the first zone, we're really talking about the automated data movement of the data, and we'll talk in more details about how each of these different zones really help to provide that end-to-end -end data pipeline. The second zone is really around preparing that data as well as delivering that data to these best-of-class data warehouses. And this could be either, or data repositories, this could be a data lake or a data warehouse. And in both cases, it's really about how do you assemble that data and move that data or build out the model-based approach to rolling out this data 
as analytic ready data as quickly and automatically automatic as possible for those end consumers of that data. But then on the bottom of that is really the need for operational management of this end-to-end -end data pipeline. So the ability for you to provide centralized management, monitoring, alerts, as well as analytics of what that end-to-end -end pipeline is providing so that you can make sure that you provide the meet the SLAs that the line of business needs for those data analytic requirements. So making sure that the data from all those various source systems gets over to those data warehouses in real time so that the analytic consumers can take the most advantage of it. So that centralized management becomes a key part, component of this platform to provide that end-to-end -end visibility of not only the platform, but also the underlying metadata for that. Now, when you combine Microsoft into this solution, and specifically the Azure platform, you start to see how Azure complements this and provides a key ingredient in this when, in terms of the data delivery, as well as the consumers of this, those analytic consumers. And it could even be analytic applications that are tying into the insights that are being pulled out from in, when this strategy. And like I said, Rajiv will talk specifically more about Azure SQL Data Warehouse and how that has really proven to be a great solution for these types of architectures. So let's move down to the next level and really talk about the data pipeline and really these various components within the pipeline so we understand how that move, movement occurs. So in the first zone, we're really talking about the movement of the data into the landing zone. And really what that landing target could be is really any types of targets that you'd wanna move that into. Today, we're specifically talking about the data warehouse, but data lakes, uh, relational databases, and any number of streaming targets are also uh, landing zones that can be utilized by this first landing zone. And it's really about automating this uh, using an agentless approach following standard-based connectivity such as ODP, ODBC to provide a very low impact solution for this. The solution also processes the movement in memory for high performance data ingest and delivery process. So you're gonna get that very high performance and continuous automated data replication to this. This also automates a lot of the manual processings that you would use today in those manual ETL approaches, th things such as schema creation or heterogeneous data type mapping. It also propagates schemas and automatically transitions from a full load of the data into that change data capture so that as committed transactions occur on those source systems, they're automatically sent to those target systems for that first leg of that automation of the end-to-end -end pipeline. So the second piece of this is really now getting that data prepared for your analytics users. And that's really in the case we're talking about today is getting that data for data warehouses and specifically SQL data warehouse, who we'll talk about specifically today. And it works hand in hand with that landing zone to not only pull that data over in the schemas that are built within that landing zone, but also pulling any, any of that change data and propagating that data down through the various um, la layers within the, the data warehouse, as well as the da data marts. And this is, incorporates all those automation of tasks that are manually performed in other tools. This is tasks such as blending of the data across schemas or the enrichment of the data models and the movement of the data from the landing to the staging down to the data mart, the data warehouse, and the data marts. Some other important aspects of this is the automation of the workflows and the ability for you, the customer, to schedule how often they want those changes to propagate into the data warehouse and to the data mart. And we'll show you a little bit of a demo of this and how these different components work together to automate that end-to-end -end delivery of that data from the source systems all the way through this data zone. At this point, I want to transition over to Rajiv to talk more about the SQL Data Warehouse and the benefits that solution provides. Thanks, Joel. So you heard from uh, from Joel how a set of automation solutions can lead to real business agility. 
Uh, and I wanted to spend some time on how Microsoft's Azure SQL Data Warehouse further accelerates your time to value what your line of business uh, folks are asking you to deliver in real time. So there are really, next slide please. Next slide, please. Yeah. So there are uh, really five reasons uh, that we think that uh, Azure uh, Data Warehouse, ADW, also called ADW, that it provides in terms of compelling business value. The first step is uh, developer productivity. What this essentially means that uh, you can use the similar set of widely available developer skills and tools that you are already using, for example, to manage on-prem SQL environments. The fact that uh, Azure Data Warehouse is managed is a managed Azure cloud service means that you can set up uh, your data warehouse environments in minutes. No long cycles of procurement setup. It's a, a managed service that can be set up fairly fairly rapidly. The second piece is uh, Microsoft uh, leads the industry in terms of security and compliance certification. Uh, not only that. For the case of Azure Data Warehouse, there are further layers of security that have been built in. Uh, in, in particular, the granular security at the row and column level, which means that you can now make the power of the analytic solutions available to a wider set of users without getting into some clunky setups uh, where you have to put some filters or you know scripts to control the uh, control data access. There is one version of Truth, and the access to the the data warehouse is is controlled really at, at the source. The scenario could be you have a set of geodiverse employees, some vendors, okay, who needs need access to access to access to data and insights. So you don't have to create multiple copies of data warehouse in those specific regions. You just have one. You you just control security at at the role level, which obviously has got implications in terms of. Uh, uh, the the not only securing the data but also in terms of productivity the third piece is and i think this is probably the most significant piece of innovation that has come out of uh, uh, azure sql data warehouse is being the separation of compute and the storage layers which allows uh, customers not only to control costs but also to finally align the workloads with with the performance what this means is that for the time that you don't run the data warehouse engine, you don't pay for the compute resources. You just pay for the storage resources. Uh, this also has allowed us to provide high performance storage cache close to compute, uh, thereby driving major performance improvements over the last several quarters. And we continue to raise the bar as I'll, I'll, I'll share with you in a moment. Uh, Azure Data Warehouse further supports business agility by allowing you to define workload prioritization. Okay, what this means is that the workloads that need to be uh, 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 that need to be curated uh, on a consistent uh, uh, and a, in a timely fashion, the most business critical workloads and requests can take priority over the data warehousing resources, right? Uh, and this is enabled by defining workload classification and importance. And this is a development that has also been enabled both in Gen One and Gen Two of SQL Data Warehouse. The fourth piece is around the flexibility. So this is one solution that allows you to work with uh, multiple and variety of data types, and uh, they really work. And this solution really works really seamlessly with uh, both the first-party Azure uh, services as well as ISP partner services for ingestion, transformation, modeling, and serving of data. So it's so it's not only uh, the Azure uh, 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 native services, but there's a rich ecosystem of of your partners who are complementing and enhancing uh, this entire cloud scale analytic, analytic solutions. Uh, and finally, I, I think this is the most important piece of uh, announcements uh, that, that came out uh, from Microsoft. Uh, Azure Data Warehouse leads the industry both in terms of raw performance as well as price per performance, as I will share with you uh, shortly. Uh, next slide, please. 
Yeah, so this uh, is a graphic uh, that that shows our industry leadership. This is the the result of a recent TPCH benchmark uh, that was uh, commissioned by Microsoft uh, coming out of uh, uh, of Gigaom that ran a, a representative sam sample of uh, complex co corporate queries, and what we observed that uh, Azure DW uh, consistently outperformed the competition. So first up, price per performance terms. Uh, ADW was uh, uh, 3x cheaper than Snowflake, 30% cheaper compared to Redshift, and 12 to 17 times cheaper than uh, uh, Google BigQuery. And in terms of raw performance, uh, uh, in terms of the query responses, response times, uh, Snow, uh, AD, ADW was 7x faster than Snowflake, uh, two times faster than Redshift, and 14 times faster than Big, BigQuery. Uh, so and uh, uh, these results uh, uh, can be uh, can be seen at uh, public this publicly available resource and I'll share the link uh, in the next slide. Next slide, please. Yeah, so you can download this this report at uh, uh, our website. Uh, essentially, uh, this report talks about uh, the, the, the benchmarking methodology, what workloads were run, what configurations were uh, were, were implemented in the uh, uh, in this in this report. And net net, uh, the 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 bottom line is it's unparalleled uh, price performance and an incredible value uh, that we are able to bring to the table. So, with this brief introduction, I would hand it back over to Joel. All right, thanks, Rajiv. So let me go into a demo scenario. And what I want to do is just briefly introduce this. We'll spend maybe only a few minutes on this demo, but I want to kind of sh show that how we actually do end-to-end -end automation of this uh, data warehouse into SQL's uh, Azure SQL data warehouse. And it's really around you know processing that data, discovering from those systems both the full full load of the data as well as that change data. Being able to use a model-driven approach by reviewing the model, discovering that model from those sources, and then adding the enrichment of that model to match the analytic needs. And then how we can automate the creation of the data warehouse, auto-generate the mappings as well as the ETL uh, code to actually move that data not only from the staging, the landing zone to the staging into the warehouse, but also any of that change data that comes across there as well. And then finally, the ability to create, with just a few clicks, uh, automatic data marts uh, in multiple different formats that are provisioning that data out to the analytics teams in the manner that they're really looking at it. So really, end-to-end -end automation of the analytics data in an efficient fashion to really kind of help answer those needs that are the challenges that those customers are facing today with their on-premise warehouses. The final piece is really how you could actually automate that end-to-end -end workflow and schedule this. I had mentioned this earlier in terms of scheduling this on demand or as fast as you want to get that data into there. So moving those change data in in parallel to multiple different data marts at the same time, or you could actually even provide this to each constituent separately, depending on what the business needs of each of those in consumers are. So let's switch over and look at the demo. So this is my live system that's really connected to an Azure SQL data warehouse. And it's really about uh, setting up those connections and automating the process through this process. So the first phase here is really just setting up the connections to where your, your enterprise data warehouse is. And here's where we've got our SQL data warehouse. And we specify where we're going to send that data, as well as where we're going to source that data from. And it could be any number of source uh, landing zones that we're pulling that data in from. We use a model-based approach to actually uh, build out that model, and it really starts by discovering that data using standard-based connectivity. So we just use standard-based approaches such as JDBC to actually read through the schema and understand the rich metadata of that schema that's already been selected for that. And you could actually hand-pick which data you want to pull in there, and we automatically will discover 
all the tables within that schema. We've already done it here, and I'll kind of show you what the results of that discovery process is. We actually understand the model, the relationships, and I can actually show you the keys here, where we actually go and read the rich information of that source schema to understand not only the primary key and the relationships, but also any kind of foreign keys and the attributes for those relationships. And this will help you provide that rich model of the data across your enterprise and all across your various source systems. We further allow you to manage those entities that are created and providing that rich, slowly changing dimension so that you have that full rich history of the change data propagated into your warehouse. And as well as the ability for you to enrich this data using new attributes or even new relationships to different schemas. We also map this data automatically to the physical model, which is our standard-based approach to that third normal data warehousing format. And here you can see examples of both our hub and satellite approach for that third normal form within the data warehouse. So in our hubs, you'll see that we have those key characteristics, those type one dimensions that are created, as well as those satellite tables that provide that, that rich history using the from and to dates of those change data across that. So we automatically map from the logical view into the physical model for these, at, these various entities and allow you to enrich this data along each path. The final piece is really that lineage we were talking about so we could see end to end how that data elements flow from the source systems down into the warehouse and into the data marts. We can also see any time where we might have new attributes that originate within the warehouse, we can actually show exactly where those elements properly come from as well. Once you've finished your model, then you move into the warehouse and we have the ability to automatically create the warehouse from that. So we automate this process and I'll show you a little bit of the what we've created here. So when I create this, we take the model automatic mapping from the, the logical view into the physical view and actually create all of these warehouse tables for you. So we automate that process and allow you to automate the creation of all your tables. And you can see from this, the richness of the SQL that we generate to run that creation of those tables. Once the tables are created, we also handle the automatic mapping of the data from the landing zone into your staging zone and then down into each of the in downstream data warehouse columns as well. From the enrichment perspective, we allow uh, an easy to use expression editor that allows you to enrich the data, providing new calculated fields, for example, like a, a column like the total amount on a low order. And you can see where we've actually allow you to pull the data elements and easily perform calculations on these along with the ability to parse and test this data. So I can test to make sure that the formula I've created is exactly what I'm expecting. So again, it's all about the automation of this process from the end to end. We also allow you to map up or do lookup data and essentially automation the process of a join to a lookup table. Maybe this is reference data that has also been pulled in, but looking up different fields, but without having to know all the seek, seek, uh, sequence of the, the join and the left join, right join, and, and any of the attributes there. You're just really building, again, using this simple expression builder to pick how the relationship works, your where clause, and then what column you want to look up, which would be, again, your select clause. So really just e simplifying that whole entire process for you. Now, we also allow the ability to profile the data within that staging zone so you can understand what is the data within that staging. So you know what's going to actually be loaded into your warehouse. This is where you can interface with your, uh, your SME from either, each of these different business areas that can actually help you understand what different quality or cleansing rules that you might need to set up for this data. Then you move into your quality rules and actually create the automation of 
any kind of creation cleansing rules or validations you'd want. Again, using this simple to use expression builder, you can look at any of the columns, tie into operations or functions on that data to validate or cleanse any of the data when in here. Then we also allow the ability to accept and report or reject data that doesn't match those cleansing rules. All this gets automated into your ETL that can be automatically generated at this phase of it. So we automatically generate all of the ETL from not only the initial load, but also any of those change data to allow that data to be propagated down directly into those, those downstream data warehouse systems. So if I look at these commands, you can see the richness again of this, what's created for you. And this is again, all this automation that was manual in those prior warehouse projects, which is why the, the need for an automation really helps you propagate that data in real time down to those systems. So this actually automates all the loading of all the warehouse. The final piece in the automation of the data warehouse is then the generation of your end consumers from automating the, the data marts. And here again, we provide the ability to build build a wizard that walks you through the creation of your star schemas, depending on the type that you want, based on the data, as well as the constituents needs for analytics, whether it's transactional, aggregated, or state. And we'll walk you through a wizard that will allow you to pick your facts, transaction dimensions, and transaction dates automatically for you. We'll just show you a couple examples of what was automatically done in prior steps here. But automating that process of, again, creating that tables, once we determine what our fact table is, our dimensions, we can see the richness of data into now our star schema and that denormalized analytics ready form that those analytics teams will need. Again, the, that whole generation of the ETL, as well as the ability to add new data elements in that star scheme as well. So the, again, it's all about automating end-to-end -end that entire process of getting your data analytics ready using a model-based approach down into your data, where, data mart, data warehouse, and data marts. The other thing we also do here is automatically generate product documentation once you've finished your, your project. This also eliminates the time that's required for building out documentation. This is all distributed as a set of HTML files that can then can be published and sent to your analytics team so that there's no additional lengthy process of a documentation step that probably never usually gets done anyway. This actually goes through the whole entire setup of everything that was just done and completed within that data warehouse automation project down to your star schemas and down to your source systems as well. So that the analytics team has everything they need for that analytics solution. So that really concludes really the demo portion of this. And let me switch back over here. And I'll turn this back over to Carol to wrap up. Thanks, Joel. Uh, before we get to the question and answer session, let me just let the audience know where to go for more information. Uh, we have a free download of Attunity Replicate for Microsoft Migrations. This software moves um, data from, I think it's 10 different sources. Attunity Replicate itself moves data from over 40 sources, but this free download will move data from 10 sources, such as Netiza and Teradata, to the Azure SQL Data Warehouse. So I would encourage you to uh, take a test drive of that. Um, we have a community for Attunity Replicate for Microsoft Migrations that you can get to by going to attunity.com backslash Microsoft Migrations. And lastly, and this may answer one of the early questions we got in from our audience, um, how do I learn more about Attunity Compose? Is there a free trial? Well, right now there's not a free trial of Attunity Compose, 
but you can sign up for a free two hour workshop. And this means that we will have subject matter experts come to your um, office or uh, run a two hour uh, sort of a webinar or online program where we'll look at your environment and help you understand how you can uh, move your data warehouse to the Azure SQL data warehouse. And so that's what we can do for more information. And now let's get to your questions. Let me open it up to our um, panel of experts here. We've got Joel, we've got um, Kaiser Larson who's joined us as well from Microsoft as well as Rajiv Jain. So question number one, um, is there a limit in database size for Azure Data Warehouse? Rajiv or um, Kaiser, do you want to take that one? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we hear you fine, Kaiser. And there was limit in database size? Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I can't, I don't remember exactly what we do have, what the gigabyte might be, uh, but we do have a, a, a limit in, in small size. Um, I can I can follow up with whoever is asked specifically or um, or whatever works. But yeah, we do have a small limit on size, um, and I, I can look up what the exact specs are. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm going to send this question to Joel, um, and maybe you can help me with it. It's the second question, Joel. Um, what basis did you decide the data warehouse table distribution, RR or hash? Can you answer that question, Joel? Okay, I'm trying to look through the questions. I'm not sure I see that. Can you read it again? I don't what? know if I... What based, basis did you decide on the data warehouse table distribution, RR or hash? Yeah, I know in, in the... Um, I think there's a couple different ways that we can set up the partition keys, and I can definitely follow up with um, how you'd want to set that up uh, for your data warehouse. Okay. Um, let me ask another question then. Um, how is the schema changes in the source handled? Yeah, so from a, a automation of the data warehouse, um, in each one of the phases, and that's one of the things I didn't probably point out in the demo, but we have a validate button that allows you to validate um, what the, the difference is between the model in each phase. So once we get to the model phase, uh, you can validate, like if you've made changes or updates within the model phase, you can validate the warehouse and it can automatically tell you whether there's differences between the model phase to the um, warehouse phase and give you the either the option of, if it can, automate uh, set up an automation script that will actually go ahead and uh, recreate or like if so if it's something like adding a new table column or deleting one you can decide whether you want to automate that or um, just generate a script that you can uh, tell it schedule when you want to change that make those changes to your downstream process uh Okay, I just wanted to jump in here. I just looked at the online documentation on docs.microsoft.com and to the question on uh, the database uh, object size, the max size for Gen 2 is 240 terabytes for row store and unlimited storage for column store tables. Uh, maybe, uh, is there a way for me to put uh, this link into a window, Carol? Um, sure, why don't you send it to me, Rajiv, and we'll um, put it in a blog article, and we'll, okay. link, we'll link to that in a follow-up email to um, all of our attendees today. Yeah, yeah, but it's it's available on, on docs.microsoft.com uh, on, uh, 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 on the documentation, which is, has got a fairly comprehensive, uh, uh, you know, set of uh, uh, capacity and workload, uh, uh, work, workload limits. Yeah, for example, it also talks about one, one twenty, concurrency of 128, which is kind of, I think, 2x or 3x compared to uh, the nearest competitor there. Thank you, Rajiv. Yeah. We have another question now that I'll send to Joel. Um, how does CDC or Attunity's change data capture work? 
Yeah, so what we do is we look at the uh, transaction logs of the various source systems, and then we really just look for committed transactions and then propagate those transactions as soon as they're committed and we read them uh, to the uh, target system. Does that answer your question? I think I think that sounds that sounds pretty good. Um, again, we'll answer all the questions in a blog article and get that link out to everyone as well. Um, get the dialogue going. Um, I have another question uh, sent to Joel or uh, Rajiv or Kaiser, whoever wants to jump in. Um, there are three copies of the same data: source, data lake, data warehouse, and your architecture. How does CDC help with storage space? Yeah, so really the, the three pictures in the architecture were really roundabout choices. So, you know, not everybody's doing all three. Uh, really, it's, you know, most people might just choose one. They may change a data lake and a, a, a data warehouse. And it really is up to the uh, the constituents on or who the consumer is on what their architecture is going to look like. That was really showing the very breadth of scopes. But from a, 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 a source uh, or a uh, storage perspective, uh, we do have various things that we can do. Uh, for example, on the data lake process, that's really where the storage becomes more of an issue, especially when it comes to change processing. And what we do is we provide uh, various different tasks along the way, like a compactor task that allow you to compress all your Delta files and reduce those down to a single file, as well as automating the aggregation of your changes so that you've got a consistent partition of those changes in that file system across the data lake as opposed to just continually sending out brand new files each time. Okay, thank you. Uh, here's another question. Can you do transformations and join at a data mart level instead of a data warehouse layer? Yes, yeah, so in the, the uh, data mart layer, you're really just picking your, and we didn't walk all the way through the wizard. I can definitely follow up with maybe some uh, screen captures within the follow-up blog. Uh, but when you do go walk through the wizard, you're really just picking your fact tables and your um, dimensions, and you can add dimensions at a later point in time. And that's really where you're drawing the relationship uh, between your fact table and your dimensions. A lot of that's gonna come automatically from your, your uh, warehouse views. Uh, but automatically provides that denormalization of that third normal file based on those relationships. Okay, uh, here's another question then. Uh, we want to use ADLS as a target. Does a Tunity um, capability and process steps you showed for SQL DW, are they the same for ADLS? So that's where in the architecture diagram we really were talking about both the um, uh, data lake pipeline or the pipeline for both data lakes as well as uh, data warehouses. And it's slightly different because when you're talking about data lakes, um, you're not really talking about a SQL engine on the file system. Really, you're, you're talking more about, you know, the in ADLS, you're really talking about a hierarchical file system. And a little bit of the process is different, but it's really following a lot of the same constructs in terms of how do you get that data analytics ready. Um, you won't have the same blending of schemas that you, the way that you do within the warehouse, but it's a similar type approach. Okay, here's a question for uh, Kaiser or Rajiv. Uh, there's interest in knowing the low end size pricing model for ADW. Okay, so can you be a little bit more specific when you say low end, what, what do you mean? I just have the question, uh, just... Uh, okay, want to I, can, I, can, just, I can ask, yeah. I can respond to this in a, in a generic, uh, generic fashion. Okay, so uh, the way we are able to significantly cut down on the pricing compared to what else is available is in the market is... is uh, the architectural level changes that we did with Gen 1 and we kind of perfected those changes in Gen 2, which is the separation of uh, storage and compute. So in a appliance-based environment, for example, okay, it's a fixed set of compute and storage. So whether you are 
uh, using uh, X units of uh, of data warehousing compute or Y units of data warehousing compute. I think that that cost the, the, the compute cost, which is kind of expensive, is is kind of fixed. Whereas for uh, uh, Azure DW, uh, W2 Gen 1 and Gen 2, those the storage and uh, the compute are kind of separated out. So you don't pay for uh, pay for compute when you are not using the data warehouse. And uh, I can actually go to our uh, pricing uh, uh, page. Okay, if you can, if you go to, uh, uh, I'll, I'll just bring up the page. Uh, it is it is it's fairly uh, re represents the uh, the pricing fairly, fairly clearly okay De depending on what is the uh, what are the comp uh, uh, dw compute units that you are using and storage is priced at the rate of 122 dollars per uh, terabyte per month okay and there are i think more than two dozen configuration in terms of compute, so you can uh, easily using the price calculator you can you can you can compute. Uh, you can go to the pricing page of Azure SQL DW uh, page, and uh, uh, from there you, for your specific compute and storage requirements, you can easily arrive at a number. Uh, if you are, if, uh, I, I hope that kind of uh, addresses your question. Okay. Yeah, and on, to on top of that too, um, I think Rajiv alluded to it as well as. You, you can you can pause your data warehouse your data warehouse with SQL DW. So if, if you want to pause it, it, if it goes back to a lot what Joel's Joel's talking about with elasticity. If you want to pause it and you're not want to be using it from a certain time, then you'll pause your compute and you won't be paying for for compute, which is goes back to that that uh, one of the the big benefits that Rajiv was saying of you know separating that that storage and compute for uh, for your data warehouse. Yeah, I am just in front of the page and uh, for uh, uh, DW100, okay, which is uh, the the lowest end, uh, the pricing it as is at the rate of $1.208 per hour, right? And at the other extreme is DW30,000C, uh, where uh, the pricing is at uh, $362.4 per hour. Okay, thank you very much. Um, last question, uh, does Microsoft recommend landing the data from Attunity as change data capture technology directly in the data warehouse or in another landing zone first? I am not too clear about the question. Uh, maybe Joel, you wanna jump in on that one. Yeah, can you repeat the question again, please? Uh, does Microsoft recommend landing the data from Attunity's change data capture technology uh, directly in the data warehouse or in another landing zone first? Yeah, I'm not aware that there's any recommendation on a different landing zone. Normally you'd land it into a staging uh, area within the data warehouse and then then the, um, the attunity really helps move it into where it needs to go from that point on. All right. Well, I want to thank everybody for their time today. This webinar is being recorded, and uh, shortly after this uh, webinar is over, we will get a link out to everybody of the recorded webinar. Thank you very much for your time today. Bye-bye. Thank you.